Um, hello, my name is uh, Janaka Subhikram. I'm from uh, um, OptiScan in Melbourne, and I, I'm an embedded software engineer. Um, yep. Um, first of all, I'll um, just um, I would like the audience to be interested in embedded uh, free and open source software um, and family with uh, embedded Linux and Linux tools as well, such as Dynx tools or whatever embedded ones you use. Um, and don't be disappointed, the, uh, the actual pro uh, pr product that we are building is only about 20% software, the rest are hardware, mechanical, optical and all that. And uh, also the, the product itself is still in prototyping stage. Uh, the first generation product is out in the market, but the second generation, which uses open source software, is in uh, prototyping stage. Um, if you guys have any questions, just raise your hand and uh, uh, ask questions. Um, and apologies for using Windows. I've had problems in this machine uh, uh, with um, using Linux and um, projectors, so that's why I'm using Windows. Uh, first of all, um, the outline, um, I'll give a quick outline of what the company does um, and the architecture of the, genera the Generation 2 product, um, role of open source software in the product itself, um, detailed look at the achievements, what we achieved, and a video presentation of um, those results, and then the questions. And also, um, you, you probably see some pictures on the right hand side. Um, they are from our first generation product, which is actually in the market. Um, they are actually cells inside people's gut and um, the di digestive system. Um, the second generation, we've already achieved better um, resolution in pictures. So, um, okay. What does the company do? Um, OptiScan provides um, indoor microscopes for bigger companies such as Pentax, Carl Zeiss. Um, so what you can see here is an indoor microscope. That is our main line of product. And we do the software to uh, control it and uh, get the images out. Um, what what these bigger companies do is they get these endomicroscopes, put them in an endoscope with additional stuff like a high resolution cameras and that sort of thing, and then um, you know sells and makes money out of it. Um, OptiScan also produces some uh, research instruments, and this is one of those research instruments. Okay, um, the advantages of endomicroscopy. Um, as you all probably know, endoscope is something that you put uh, through the mouth or the bottom to uh, find out what's inside, yeah, or the nose, yeah. Um, with endomicroscope, you're pretty much providing a microscopic capability to the endoscope. So um, one of the advantages of our product itself is that it can actually look under the skin. Um, I'll explain that in a second. Um, it's easy to view active cells with that technology. Usually for medical products, what they do is they take biopsies, you know, grabs chunks of meat out, puts it under microscope. By that time, they're dead. The uh, actual cells are dead. So with our product, you can actually look at live um, cells where, you know, you can see the blood flowing and all that. Um, and also make a 3D map of the tissue, I'll explain that in a second as well. Um, and the major improvement is there's no need for biopsy. So you don't have to grab chunks of meat out of your gut or whatever of your patient. What you have to do is pr pretty much use the product and um, it doesn't have any side effects or anything like that. Um, that means minimum recovery time because normally for a um, biopsy, it's about two to three weeks recovery time. So they'll feel sick after a biopsy. So there's no recovery time with that product. And also, um, uh, 
uh, we can identify cancerous cells preemptively. Um, so a trained uh, doctor can look at a cell, see, oh, that looks normal, and that doesn't. And then they can target biopsies if they want to, you know, reconfirm, because our, in most cancerous cells, that one has about 90% accuracy in, in uh, identifying cancerous cells. So they can look around using our product, and to confirm, they can do the biopsies if they would like. And that's one of the procedures. I can't remember whether this was an animal trial or whether this is a human trial, but uh, yeah, it's just a picture of one of the procedures. And um, I've just included the um, digestive tract top and bottom. So that's where it goes through, or it goes through that end up to there um, to have a look at you know, uh, what sort of um, uh, diseases they have. Okay, the, uh, yeah. So it's like the smaller intestine, no. I don't think there's many products that go through, yeah. Um, uh, product has a 0.7 micrometer resolution, so that's pretty high. Um, and it has vertical slices, it can take vertical slices every seven microsecond, mi micrometer meters. Um, yeah, the, um, the the camera, big camera looking thing, which is about uh, 15 mils or so, has the pencil looking uh, endo microscope in it, plus they have additional things like lights or a high definition camera and so forth. That's right. No, but, but some of our research products is just that little bit only. And they're more, mostly rigid things that uh, you have to have a little uh, incision and put it, put them through. But they are usually for research. Um, you you're absolutely right. That that's how the doctors do with with that. Uh, product with the, you know, uh, um, they usually have a macro look, look around, and if they see any, you know, suspect uh, marks, then then what they do is they use a um, microscope to home in and have a look around the surrounding area. Um, and the the second generation can achieve about four frames per second at um, high, high de definition sort of. Uh, resolutions. Okay, the theory of how it works. The confocal theory is pretty much what we do is we send a laser through a, a optical fiber cable, um, and that's the end of the endoscope, and we focus it on a piece of tissue, and that excites uh, photons inside in in the skin itself which gets emitted, and that's refocused back into the optical fiber, and back, and we detect it using a, a photomultiplier tube. And one of those uh, detections, we take it as a pixel. Um, then what we do is we move the actual, um, the fiber itself in a known stable frequency in, in let's call it X, and then we move the entire thing in, in a Y direction, entire assembly, which gives us a raster pattern of the entire surface. And um, we can get one of these images, on, you know, half as, about four frames a second. So the um, actual, um, uh, the, the, the movements are very, very quick. There's a lot of calibration that goes into it as well. Yep. What one pixel that's scanning? That's right, physically. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it happens so quick that yeah, we get high resolution. Um, you know, four four frames a second sort of thing. And 
Um, I'll explain how the 3D works, but we get pretty much slices of uh, images um, on top of the skin and underneath. So I'll just explain how we do that in the next slide. Okay. Um, what we what I show here is pretty much um, this is what a skin cell looks like inside or outside your body, um, and we focus our photons. There's a, there's a lot of optical science go, this goes into that I don't understand, but um, we focus it on sort of this blue plane, and then on the right hand side I show the the view of the picture we get out of our instrument. And then, then we move the focal plane up or down to get slices. Um, and you get different slices. This could go up to 250 micrometers below your skin. So doctors actually can see cancerous uh, lumps starting off from the inside. OK. Um, Generation two product architecture. Uh, this is what we've been using open source pretty much for uh, many things in the here. Um, it's, we start off with a scanner producing these little pixel information, which gets um, optically transferred to the detector board, which has a photo multiplier tube which multiplies it. And then uh, it produces digital signals with the main processor, we call it the EPM. Um, grabs onto and it then uses, it has actually Linux installed in it. Um, and it, we uh, created a device driver which pulls data off that and shoves it up the network. And anyone listening on a PC on, on the network, it could be unicast, broadcast, whatever, um, can, can get that picture. So that's our basic architecture. Um, the main processor itself runs, as I said, embedded Linux. It, it runs MPC 8349 uh, CPU with uh, 256 RAM, 16 megabytes of flash, and large um, external flash drive as well. Uh, has a custom FPGA, which actually does the capturing of um, the data that comes from the detector board. And then, uh, we have USB connectivity to detector boards and other peripheral boards. And also, as I said, there's a, a Linux device driver and a daemon process that transfers all this image data through. And also, a, a graphics card just to um, show simple images. In, in this main process itself, we, have, we put a PCR graphics card which shows simple images of what's coming through. And then, uh, as I said, it uses a micro microsys uh, processor board. Okay, the uh, <coughs> peripheral boards themselves, they, um, some of them run the laser, some of them have uh, optical filters and attenuators, some of them you know, run scan units, photo multipliers, power supplies. They all connect to the EPM board that I talked about. Um, the peripheral boards use uh, free Atos, um, another free open source real-time operating system. Um, I'm not going to be talking about um, free Atos because um, one of my colleagues is working on it and he knows more than me. Um, and um, some of these paraphernalia, as I said, has FPGAs to do some of the work. And uh, they run um, uh, SAM 97, well, 91 SAM 7S256 processors with that sort of specs. Okay, uh, and the host computer basically, it could be any sort of computer, receives the data and uh, displays it. it. It also has a .NET based uh, control app that could uh, control the entire system. So the, on, the only thing the host app does is send control messages and gets um, um, image information. Okay, role of open source. As I said, um, 
we use uh, SAM 7 port of uh, FreeRTOS. Uh, software for the EPM, we use U-Boot. Um, Denx 2.6 uh, Linux kernel. Um, ELDK 4.1 um, and the tool set. Um, we use Mono for some of the apps in the EPM itself and also DirectFB to display image data and then DBus and Health for USB notification. Um, other utilities. Um, we use NAND and NUnit for which are also sort of free uh, for C sharp, you know, t testing of um, this uh, unit testing, pretty much. Um, U boot bootloader. Um, what we did was we started off with the micro C standard U boot. Um, then I had to set up all the uh, block allocation tables and memory windows and for local bus and the FPGA, and then the pre PCI graphics card as well. Um, and then we implemented local bus. Uh, timing um, using this on-chip, um, system on-chip um, timing engine, which is really cool. What um, you can actually, uh, Microsys uh, gives this tool where you can actually set the timing. Um, it's a graphical tool so for the local bus, so you can set you know, address timings and data timings and whatever, and it gives you a nice table of values. You plug those values into this hardware engine and bang, it, it does the timing for you. So it's, it's a real, really powerful way of doing local bus timing. You know, in the olden days, we, I guess I'm not that old, but um, <laughs> we used to have um, uh, sort of delayed states and whatever for, um, you know, local bus from RAM timings and whatever. But now these sort of engines are really powerful in that way. Um, and we did some more customization of various things. Okay, Linux, we got, uh, as I said, a uh, version of Linux from Denx, from Git, Git branch. We had to convert it from PowerPC, to PPC to PowerPC branch of um, uh, Linux, because um, some, might, some of you might be aware that we needed um, to, it to be more flexible, so the PowerPC branch of the Linux gives that flexibility, whereas the PPC, you need to actually code everything in, in into the uh, Linux kernel. And the major part of our work has been on the Linux device driver. So we created a custom device driver which pulls data off uh, the FPGA. Um, <coughs> the device driver itself uses a um, DMA engine within the, um, the CPU to, to pull data out and then dump it into main memory. And um, then we use a, a user space daemon process to grab that data, send it out via the network. Um, we started off with direct mode, which is basically every block of data, software has to intervene and say, hey, um, send this up which was way too slow. So we improved it with uh, chain mode DMA. Um, um, I had a lot of heart heartache doing chain mode DMA because when you set up the chain to do things, the engine keeps filling these data buffers and um, it, it was a continuous loop. So um, we had to have uh, different um, notifying mechanisms to notify uh, whoever is looking after that data because if the user space doesn't pull data out before the DMA engine puts data in, then we have to have a backup recovery mechanism. So I did spend quite a lot of time in doing this. Um, and the whole de device driver it has iOctal interface, which uses a char device uh, driver. Sorry, um, it's a char device. Um, and the user space app gets the data from the uh, uh, device driver from um, using a map. That was the quickest way we found how to do it. 
and uh, I talk about the um, user space app he daemon here. So it's a daemon process, connects to the um, device driver. It has, um, I also created a little in cursors app that you can see there to control the device driver. And um, the daemon process just sends the data out using normal UDP type um, APIs. Um, and PCI graphics. Um, the card we selected was from XGI. It was a 2D um, graphics card, um, but we don't use any of the acceleration on it. Uh, we, I got um, it to work under that resolution, 1600 by 1200 on 32 bits, um, and wrote a few programs to do some pattern writing and checking of the of the actual writing processes and so forth. Um, compiled uh, DirectFB 1.3 and wrote a little uh, C++ wrapper which wraps um, the DirectFB API and gives an interface to Mono which um, grabs the, the data and shoves it down and gives you a little picture. We found doing any sort of um, graphics processing using the CPU is very, very slow, so don't do it. Um, okay, results. Now, I will show, show you guys these results. Okay, first of all, um, what I did is I got a household fly, um, a dead one of course, got the wing of it, put it in front of uh, this second generation microscope, and this is part of the household fly's uh, wing. And you can see this microscopic sort of um, hairs. And uh, I have a few pictures which show different slices um, through the fly's actual wing. Um, sort of overexposed as well. Okay, next set of results is the same fly. I got the eye of the fly. Um, and put it in front of the microscope, and this is the actual pattern in, in, in the eye. You can see the curvature of it, the eye. You can also see some of the um, lenses have dried off of the, uh, the fly, so they're, they're, they look like cobwebs in there. Um, so we do have reasonably high magnification on uh, even dead items. <laughs> okay. So what I just showed there is different slices, pretty much like a walkthrough. Okay. Then what we did, what I did was um, basically grabbed a normal thread, and this, um, this one is a picture of how I um, put it in front of the microscope. This is the microscope in this end. This end, I'll explain in a second what it is. And I'll show you a video of um, imaging this. I wanted to see the fibers within the thread themselves. So I just created a little video. Uh, and those are actual little fibers on the thread. And I'm moving the Z axis, so I'm just getting slices of it at the moment. Um, I have a better, better image soon. This device hasn't been cal cal calibrated, so the images are a bit blurry and so forth. Um, and this is this, those, these are those fibers within the string itself. And you can see some of the strings actually have been damaged. Uh, some of the fibers have been damaged. Um, and this is a Windows app, by the way. Um, Okay, back to presentation. Um, as I said, this thing, this rod here, at the end of the rod, you can see a little tiny speck. What that is, is an electron microscope grid. They, um, they, it's very small, and they use it to uh, calibrate electron mi microscopes. Um, and we use that to calibrate our device as well. So 
next video that I'll be showing, what we did was we used that, um, and we got some pictures of it on an uncalibrated device, so bear with me. Um, show you this one first. Um, yeah, pretty much because we haven't calibrated it, the top bit ha is wrong <laughs> and it sits in an angle as well. So we have to do a bit more work on the calibration on this second generation product, but it'll happen way before it goes to market. Um, what I'm showing you there is uh, a 1024 by 1024 image. And soon I'll be showing you uh, 1920 by 1080 image, which is a pretty much a blow up of the entire thing. Um. Okay, um, I have another grid. Oh, this is just me using my video camera to. Uh, show the same thing so sorry no um, the worst thing is I compressed into mp4 format and that's why you have that grainy um, resolution um, because the other format was too big um, the images themselves the um, okay next giving back to the community um, <coughs> since we're using open source uh, we, we decided to give back to the community. Uh, first of all, wh one of my colleagues who's working on the free RDOS has done an x86 simulated port of it, and he's given back, and it's on the, on the branch at the moment, on the, on the tree. Um, we've also given funding to the uh, free RDOS organization. We had to give it under a, a con via contract, a support contract um, because of commercial reasons. And also, um, soon enough, we'll be posting some wikis on how to do things like mono things or, and um, getting things working um, under an embedded environment. And also, um, I wish to, at some stage, um, get this device driver out into the community. It's not going to go into the kernel tree or anything like that because this is a very customized device. But if someone else is working on it, they'll have a heads up sort of thing. So that's all we are hoping to do. Okay, some pictures. Um, that's our EPM board itself, the main processor board. Um, we have Ethernet going out. Um, we have some of the signaling coming in. And uh, we have a USB plugged into one of those peripheral boards as well. So um, yeah, another picture of it, we have the microprocessor board in the middle, a carrier board, and a custom designed FPGA board on the top. Uh, yeah. Up. Bang, bang. Yeah, these ones. Yeah. Yep. The, um, they're, ju they're just headers, so we can get to the signals easily. So, so the, yeah, J just for just for debug purposes, we I mean we'll be taking taking all of the so off for the product, obviously. Um, okay. Oh, I missed one. Uh, that, this is one of those peripheral boards that I talked about. Um, you can see uh, a digital signal, um, sorry, an analog signal from the photomultiplier tube coming in and uh, digital data that this FPGA gathers going out on that. Um, I'll actually show you a picture of the photomultiplier tube as well. Slow, come on. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. It doesn't like showing the photomultiplier tube. It's a big, big black box, sorry. Um, inside it has a photomultiplier tube that multiplies uh, any photons to m many millions of times. 
Um, and this is a, a picture of the entire setup. Okay, um, I will I'll probably um, go through this as well. Um, the hardware issues, um, the elastometric connectors, th these are these are things like in your watches, digital watches, which have, it looks like a rubber pad, which has tiny wires in them. And they're good for production, but not for prototyping, because you're taking things in and out, in and out, dust specs gets in there, and then you don't know what's going on. Um, or um, when, if you tighten it too much, what happens is the, the uh, rubber itself bends, and if you have something within 0.2 of a millimeter, it might touch the next pad. So you have to be careful when you, if you're using these things for uh, your prototyping. Um, and also, be careful of supplier uh, giving you uh, data sheets and specs and stuff. Sometimes they put in chips which are pin compatible, you know, drop-in replacement, they call it. But when you look at inside, especially flash chips and stuff, internal structure is totally different. Sometimes the protocol they talk is slightly different as well. So for a software guy, it becomes a bit of a hell. Um, and s sometimes these suppliers put stickers on top, so you can't, you know, you, you can't see what the chip is, and you're expecting it to be what's on the spec, but it's not. So, yeah, it had uh, interesting problems with those. Okay. Finally, um, honest opinion. My view is um, uh, the company product is quite powerful product. Um, well, first of all, I have to say that these are my views, not my co the company that I work for. So um, they're going to get angry at me if I um, if I say that um, uh, you know their their views. Okay. Um, the product has great, great potential, um, but uh, like many successful Australian um, inventions, I think it's going to be taken off our hands by a US or a European company and commercialized, and they're going to make money. That's my honest view of it, uh, because there's, there's no Australian support and funding for our um, product. Um, I think it has great potential um, in many, many different cancers. Um, from gastrointestinal tract, they've done some investigation on pulmonary tract as well, um, and skin as well. But uh, as always, it's harder to get to medical market. It takes like three to five years to get to a market, and you have, it has to go through you know, many clinical trials. Our product, the first generation of the product has gone through um, countless clinical trials and all were successful above 80% in many cases. Uh, but I don't think there is any Australian support for, to, um, to, for it to be fully commercialized and made money out of it. So um, one of those big guys would come from overseas and take the product overseas, I reckon, to make money. Um, the, I haven't spoken about the quality side of things for medical products uh, using especially open source software. Um, at the moment, our quality manager is actively looking into um, how we can use black box and white box sort of testing for our product uh, for medical environment. Uh, our product itself doesn't have any dangers as such to the patient or the operator, so uh, we don't have to be harsh on the software as a life critical system, but it's still used for diagnosis. So um, we generally go under um, ISO 1394 classification, and there are sub classifications for software and um, the other things. But as most quality things go, they are they make sure that you do things a, a way. They don't care whether it's the right way as long as it's consistently done. So um, at the moment, we're actively looking at the, the um, uh, quality system. Okay. 
any questions? No, I, I, I couldn't um, because um, we only have two in the company and both of them are being even used even today for prototyping purposes. Uh, so, so I couldn't, sorry. Um, where, where are you based? In Melbourne. Yeah, um, South East Melbourne. Sorry? Yeah, um, th the question was uh, what else did we use in the first generation product? Um, first generation product was uh, made from full commercial software. It was a total different architecture. Um, it's not as modular as this, so you, can, you can't plug, um, let's say, new lasers into the old product. It was pretty static, but um, it, it does have advantages where, when it comes to getting it uh, through the quality system and into, um, into market, but this has much more flexibility, and because of the new uh, testing scheme, we hope to get it into market uh, sooner than what we did with the first, first generation product. Um, if you're asking what sort of software we used, um, we used, I think, Micrium um, OS. We used um, Visual Studio. Uh, it was a Windows-based one, so um, the data was taken from P using PCI bus. So it's, um, yeah, it was a totally different architecture. Any more questions? Um, yeah, I was also wondering, um, because this is a municipal product and um, uh, software is a mixed quantity, it should be naturally more stringent. Um, have you actually discussed that at all about keeping it um, in terms of the requirements and, and um, yeah, uh, software and things like that? Yeah, the question was uh, because it's a medical product. Uh, because of the string, stringent uh, classification of things, whether I can discuss about the that side of um, the, I, I categorize it generally as quality side of things. Um, yeah, um, we have a whole whole testing um, um, scheme uh, where we have used starting from whatever software we produce, we have from unit well the. We use the normal software lifecycle, so the analysis bit, sometimes prototyping to understand the technology, and then full specification, design, and then um, uh, verification. So as far as um, verification goes, there is a whole heap of um, testing we'll do uh, by the developer themselves, and then um, we, we will get a third person to to pretty much go through um, all of the main requirements and make sure that uh, none of the requirements are uh, incomplete, as well as whether there are no um, um, uh, side effects to other things. Um, under I can't off the top of my head, remember the um, exact software uh, quality, um, uh, the, the specification um, title itself, but um, it's, qu it's quite stringent in the software that we design and we y use to, ma to minimize risk. So that's pretty much risk analysis going through the entire uh, process. So that's why the development is pretty slow as well. Um, in, yeah, sure. Um, the question is, what's the startup time of this uh, generation two product? Um, at the moment, it stands at about a minute, so it's pretty hard, long. Uh, because because uh, um, embedded, you know, Linux has to boot, 
but um, we should be able to cut it down because the kernel at the moment has many things that we don't use. Um, so we should be able to cut those down and bring it down. Um, so there's less probing time on you know different buses and so forth. Um, in a in a production system, I envisage it to um, boot within let's say 30 seconds, and um, um, and then going to standby mode. So when it when it is not in use, it goes to standby and coming out of standby within five six seconds. So it'll be pretty quick. Um, the laser we use has let's say 30, 40 seconds start up time as well because the, the actual lasers themselves have to warm up. So um, so we, we're hamstrung by this. We get this OEM laser. We don't produce the laser. We just talk to it and yeah. Um, so we're hamstrung by that boot up time anyway. Yeah. How big is the laser? Um, the first generation product laser, unfortunately I couldn't show you the, um, I'll, I'll try to, that one. Okay, not that. Well, it's behind this box. I ca yeah, you can't see it. Um, the laser itself is um, it's about that big. Um, yeah, it, it is. It's two hands. Yeah, it, it, it's it's massive. The, but we've been trialing a new laser, which is much smaller. Um, the problem is we can't use um, commercially available normal lasers because um, the lasers we use has to have a specific um, wave pattern, wave format, wave um, uh, wavelengths, and um, you know they, you can't have a lot of um, uh, diffraction as well. Um, because what happens is if you use a standard laser, you'll get too much interference, too much uh, false um, positives coming through the image. So uh, the, the lasers are pretty, um, pretty you know, um, medical grade, grade lasers pretty much. So yeah, the whole unit, the new unit probably would fit in. Uh, Slightly bigger than this laptop, I'd say. The um, at the moment um, it uses about the maximum wattage is about twenty millivolts, milliwatts. Sorry, um, but for a normal procedure like the pictures I showed you, we use about uh, two and a half, three milliwatts. So it's quite, um, yeah. Uh, comparatively, so it can't really hurt anyone. Um, uh, yeah, and we d probably don't need to go any higher either. Yeah. 